Hello everyone and welcome to the second day of the Baby Brains Conference and thank you Professor Emily Jones for being here with us today uh, to talk to us about um, artificial intelligence and whether or not this can has something to do with bonds. We are talking about human bonds for the whole week. We started in London on Saturday and we're going to finish uh, next Saturday in Italy. Um, so let's see what AI can uh, yeah, well, what's the role of AI here? And we're really excited to hearing from uh, directly from you, Professor Emily Jones. Um, so you would like to um, introduce yourself and then, uh, yeah, tell us all you can tell us today about AI. Brilliant. So I'm Emily. I'm a professor at the Centre for Brain and Cognitive Development here in London. Uh, it's very hot here today, so I apologise if I'm wilting slightly. Um, and so our research focuses on looking at a range of different influences on early development. And one of the things that we've been doing more recently is looking at how we can use AI to actually help us understand babies' early development and how babies build their early social relationships. So I'm just going to share my um, slides. Can you see those okay, Sylvia? Yes, that's perfect. Brilliant. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the, the new emerging ways that, that we and others have been trying to use AI based techniques to help us understand how babies build those early bonds with um, with their social partners, with their parents, with their friends, with their siblings um, and with the people around them. And so we know that, you know, in early development, um, the brain grows through these really complicated interactions between a baby's genes. So the, the instructions that the baby's born with that tells the body how to build itself and tells the brain how to build itself and the baby's early environment. So right from the beginning, their, their genes are influencing how their, their neurons in their brain, as well as the cells in the brain that, that communicate with each other and um, are growing and developing and connecting. But right from the very beginning, the baby's interactions with their environment are also shaping that. Um, so not just postnatally, but also while baby's in the womb, of course, babies start to, to kick and start to be able to hear and you can see light patterns um, and feel the vibrations of the mother's breathing. And so they're getting all sorts of input from very, very early on. And we know that that input also helps their brain to, to grow as well. So we've got these really complicated interactions right from the beginning between what a baby is sort of comes into the world with and then what the, the world can, can provide to them. Um, and so when we're thinking about AI and early development and what it can show us and tell us, what we're interested in is how AI shapes the early environment, but also how we can use AI to understand better what children are learning about and how they're learning. So that's what I'll talk a bit about today. And one of the, the really important early environments that we know babies massively benefit from and, and learn, learn a huge amount from is, is early social environments. So babies, of course, spend most of their time in early development with either their, their mother, their father, their caregiver, their grandparents, but the people around them that, that are closest to them. Um, and, you know, of course, if they have older siblings with, with their siblings as well. And we know babies learn a huge amount from these, these relationships. So babies learn um, about one to two new actions or behaviors every day in the second year of life from the, the people around them. They learn words, they learn how to connect, how to communicate, but they also learn about their physical environment through what their caregiver brings to them or the toys that they give them or the, um, the things they place around their crib. So we know these sort of early social environments are really, really important for, for babies learning. Um, but we also know that babies don't just learn what you want them to learn. <laughs> so you can set up the, you know, what you think is the perfect learning environment with your crayons and your paper and and, and, and children will, will do their own thing. So they, they very much direct their own learning, again, really right from the very beginning. So even, you know, a newborn will decide what to look at. They might be interested in looking at your face or they might be interested in looking at something around them. And actually, I happen to have so my son's 11 now, but when he was a newborn, this was his favorite thing. He used to love to look at my purple drinking bottle um, and that was his, his pick. And so the things that babies choose to look at, to attend to, to be interested in are influencing again, right from the beginning, how their brain is, is growing and developing. And what we're interested in, in, in our group is how that process happens, but also what individual differences in what babies are interested in shape their later outcomes. So what things are, are what we call adaptive, so you know things that might um, 
support a child to, to grow and develop and develop their cognitive skills or um, develop their well-being and what things the children do that might be unhelpful for them and can we you know think about how to to change the environment to help children learn in more effective ways um, and we also know that every child is different as i said you know in terms of what children choose to do we're not working with a sort of identical model whereby every baby looks at faces, every baby wants to, to interact with people around them, and every child chooses their own activities. And we really want to understand how those individual level differences are shaping what babies can learn. And this is where we think AI can really help us. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we understand what infants like and what they're paying attention to and what methods we can use. And then how can we bring in AI to help us understand, you know, for an individual baby, what is it that most interests them, what most motivates them and, and where are they best going to learn? And one, one context in which this might be particularly important is kids who, um, who we might think of as neurodivergent. So kids who perhaps have a neurodevelopmental condition or are on a tra trajectory towards a neurodevelopmental condition. So some of the groups that we work with are babies who have a family history of autism or of ADHD. And we know that infants um, with a family history of autism or ADHD often have a greater likelihood of, of developing those conditions themselves. And babies who are sort of on that track might have very different interests or very different uh, things that they wanna pay attention to than other children. And again, we're really interested in which parts of that are real strengths for children and bring them joy and, and boost their well-being and which differences might actually predispose to some of the other co-occurring conditions that can come along with autism or ADHD like anxiety or depression um, or sleep problems and again if we can dissect out what individual babies are interested in and, and where um, where their developmental trajectory is going we might be able to help provide more supportive environments for children in, in early development. Um, so the, the key thing we need to do first is, is work out how we can measure what babies are taking in. So of course, very young babies can't tell us what they're interested in. And there's lots of ways that we use to try to, try to understand that. Um, so one, one is, you know, similar to the baby brains approach, just looking at babies and watching them and seeing what, they, what they're looking at and where they smile and what they're finding engaging. But we can also use measures of what their brain's doing to understand you know, whether when baby's looking at something, they're really attending to it. So are they really taking in information about that thing? Or are they just sort of passively staring and they're sort of zoned out a bit and they're not actually that interested? So we need ways of measuring, you know, what baby's paying attention to and learning about, because that can help us understand how their brain is then, is then specializing and, and building over time. Um, and one way we can do that is to measure what we call attention states. So we all know that, you know, sometimes our children will be looking at something and really concentrating on it. And sometimes they're staring and, you know, clearly zoned out and aren't, aren't paying attention. And we can use different methods to understand or to, to find the sort of brain measures that can tell us what attention state that the child might be in. Um, and so the, the method that we use that I'll talk a bit more about in a second is called EEG, where we have a, a net of sensors that go on baby's head and it measures um, the sort of natural activity of the brain. So it's a bit like vo recording your voice with a, a voice recorder or a microphone. It just, reflect, it just measures the, the sort of natural patterns of brain activity. But we know that certain types of brain activity happen more often when babies are attending to something than when they're not. And this can help us learn about the, the formation of what we call attention networks in the brain. Um, this is a really complicated picture, but broadly it's just showing lots of different sort of labels for different parts of the brain and showing that the connections between those are really important in, in, um, in attention. And we think that babies practicing their attention by looking at things around them and concentrating on them helps them build these attentive brain networks over time. Um, and so this is EEG, so this is the way that, that we can measure that. So this is a, oh, this is a, um, a net of electrodes on our sensors on baby's head. And this is, this is my son when he's a baby. Um, and what we get are these sort of patterns of peaks and troughs that measure the, the activity of his different um, brain regions. And we can do things like show baby videos or pictures or um, interact with them. And I'll show you in a second how we're using this now um, to understand baby's social interests. But the signals that we're measuring are certain um, patterns of, of these sort of peaks and troughs that happen at particular rates. 
So we know that we get sort of really slow brain waves when babies are asleep. But when babies are concentrating, we get slightly faster brain waves that we call these, these theta patterns. And we can use this to tell us about when baby's concentrating versus, versus when they're not. There's another signal called alpha um, that's a little bit faster than theta, and that tends to increase if babies zone out or close their eyes. So by looking at the differences between these different rhythms in the brain, we can tell how much attention babies are paying or how interested they are. And we can show that if we show babies a video of a, a person talking versus a toy, we get more brain activity. You can see these red patches um, in this theta range than we do if baby's just watching the toy. So we think that um, these are indicating that babies are engaged with people, as we know they are in early development. Um, but this is all still on the, on the group level. And what we want to do is use AI to take us down to the level of a, an individual baby. Um, and we know that looking at these kinds of brain states can tell us about later development. So, you know, if we think that paying attention to people is important in, in baby social development, um, we should see connections or associations between infant brain activity and later, later behavior. Um, and this is what we see in some of our longitudinal studies. So babies who showed more activity when they're watching a lady singing to them when they were a baby have better social skills later in development. So we think, again, you know, there's some sort of relevance to individual differences and in helping us understand individual babies and their interests and, and, and where they're going to go after that. Um, and we also know that if we do um, supportive interventions with families, we can change some of these brain signals. So this was a study where babies and their families participated in um, a parent mediated intervention, which means parents were helped to recognize the subtle signals that their child really wanted to communicate with them. Um, and that helped parents to create this sort of really supportive environment. Um, again, a bit like the baby brains approach where, you know, you're following the child's lead and watching what they want to interact with and then joining in that interaction with them. Um, and we could show that that both um, supported children to start initiating more with their parents. So babies then were showing their parent more or um, initiating these lovely interactions. But also we got more of this theta power, um, this sort of brain signature during babies looking at a social video. So over time, these sorts of enriched social experiences can really support baby's social brain activity. Um, but as I said, what we really want to do now is understand, well, you know, we know every child is different. At the group level, we can kind of see these patterns. But how do we work out for any individual baby what it is that they particularly like? Because if we can do that, we can work out how to then, you know, interact with them in a way that's going to maximally help them to, to join in that interaction. And that's the project that we're using AI for at the moment, which is called the, the BOND study. Um, so it stands for Behaviour and Online Neuroimaging to study the development of socialisation. And what we're doing here is using these EEG tools to measure what babies are tending to. And then we're using a, an artificial intelligence algorithm to work out what it is that that individual baby prefers. And so the way that it works is a little bit like this. So we create this sort of space of different um, pictures or activities that baby might like. And this is a really simple example of a space that goes from their mom to their stranger. And there's lots of faces in between. And what we want to know is, does baby pay more attention to mom or to the stranger or to, you know, somewhere in the middle? So it's a really simple example to start off with. But what we do is we show baby some of these pictures and then we measure their brain activity. So they might see a picture of mom and then we measure their brain activity and look at these different rhythms to see how much of this attentive brain signal is in there. And then based on that, we work out how much the baby seemed interested in that picture on that particular um, occasion. And then we use this artificial intelligence algorithm to try to guess, well, where do we think the baby's most interested in? So the algorithm makes a prediction and says, okay, you know, if there was lots of this brain signal to mom, I think that baby most likes the mom. And then it will pick another stimulus to kind of test that. So it might decide, well, I'm gonna pick the stranger, show it to baby to test whether I do indeed get a low level of attention to the stranger, like I think I should. And so then baby sees the stranger picture, we measure their brain activity. And if the AI was right, then we should see low levels of activity to that, um, to that stranger picture. But sometimes the AI might be wrong and actually baby's really interested in the stranger. 
And then the AI will sort of shift its model and try something else. So the AI is always trying to work out what it is that that baby is particularly interested in. Um, uh, and this is just a, an image of, of the kind of setup that, that we can use. So this study was looking at pictures on a screen. Um, but now what we're interested in is, um, is, is real life interactions. And so we can create all sorts of different types of these spaces. So lots of different ways in which social behavior could vary. And this is an example where we're looking at um, whether or not the, um, the mom is smiling or looking across <laughs> and whether the mom's looking at you or looking away from you. And so we can ask, you know, do individual babies like people that are smiling and looking at them? Or do they prefer people who look a bit more neutral? Or do they prefer people who actually don't look like they want to interact with you that are looking away? And again, we can use this algorithm to kind of search all these different pictures and identify which one any individual baby might prefer. Um, and then we can even we can make it even more sort of naturalistic. And so in this study, what we're doing is we've created this space of ways in which adults can interact with the baby. So here there's this infant directed speech. That means, you know, talking in the way that we do to babies, where our, our pitch changes and we um, exaggerate things um, whilst uh, looking away from the baby or looking towards the baby, or we can make nonverbal sounds, or we can have toys making sounds while we're not looking at baby, or we're looking at baby. So here we're trying to understand, you know, which babies prefer somebody who's quite full on, so, you know, looking at them and talking to them and singing to them, and which babies prefer actually, you know, a toy with a person who's a bit more low key and is quieter. And again, we can then try to understand what do those things predict? So do we find that babies who prefer, you know, somebody who's really over the top and engaging? Are they the babies who are also more sociable in, in other settings? And do they go on to be more sociable? Um, and do we find that babies who are quieter and prefer the toy, you know, go on to prefer quieter activities? And so that's what we're doing now. Um, so this is all sort of really early stages. We've got to the point where we can really see these big individual differences. So all these little squares just represent an individual baby. And you can see some babies prefer this infant directed speech um, with, the mom, with the person looking away from them. Some babies prefer the sort of full on, you know, mom looking at you and talking and singing. Um, and some babies preferred, you know, the, the, the toy sounds with the person looking away. So the sort of really non-social experience. And so now what we're trying to work out is what do those individual differences mean? So do those different babies show lots of differences in, in their other activities in the real world? And, you know, what does that mean developmentally? And um, so just to kind of to, to wrap it up, what, what we think we can do with AI is really try to understand how these differences in what children are choosing to do and choosing to pay attention to influence their later developmental trajectories. So if we can work out, you know, on an individual level, what an individual baby likes, then we might be able to provide those kind of supportive environments and those suggested activities that you know, really support their learning in, in the longer term. Um, and then, you know, the final thing to say is we're not trying to, to fix anybody, you know, we really want to understand what individual babies like so that then we can make sure that, you know, all that lovely neurodiversity in, in the way that, that, that children differ from each other is able to, you know, allow all children to, to flourish and, and benefit our society. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing with this. Oh, I can't hear you, Sylvia, sorry, is it just one? Silver, I think you're muted, sorry, I can't hear you, unless it's me. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I get to thank you again, which is good. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it was a really interesting talk, and um, uh, thank you for making it so understandable, even to people that are maybe uh, not expert in the field. Um, some of... Um, the people that might be following us might have recognized some bits of the bond study is also part of our new uh, baby brains body trilogy in which we try to explain um uh some of these things uh to parents as well in our communities so thank you so much for for giving us a refresher and explain and um like explaining even more so that was really 
really exciting and it's nice and it's probably different from what we're used to to hear that actually um, artificial intelligence can be a tool to improve people's lives rather than something very, very scary to just be afraid of. And so um, just really um, thinking about that, I wanted to ask you, um, if you had to sum it up in a few words, what is the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence? Social, uh, like, yeah, natural intelligence. So what, yeah, what is it actually that we are so afraid of? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's one of those questions that, you know, that there are there are debates with sort of great thinkers in the field that, that talk for hours about, you know, what the difference is. And and so I definitely won't do it great justice. But I think for me, one of the big differences at the moment is that a lot of the artificial intelligences out there are like the sort of chat GPT, you know, large language models. They're taking a lot of human generated knowledge and effectively sort of memorizing it and then using it to kind of train these models that can then link bits of that knowledge together and that's really different to what babies do where they start off knowing very little they've got their brain which has structure in there but they've not been exposed to really anything and right from the beginning they do this active learning so they pick what to learn about obviously that's kind of scaffolded by what's around them but they're not given this sort of you know long revision list of every document on the internet before they then start to do anything so I think at the moment that that's a really big difference in terms of how much of it's about you finding your own path and, and creativity and searching out the information that you think you'll need versus just being trained on kind of everything out there. But people are working on developing AI based tools that, that work more like that, that start small and kind of search out for you know bits of information. So they might converge together. But I think at the moment, that's one of the big differences. It's very interesting what you're saying, because until maybe 50 years ago or, or something like that, um, we almost thought that children were like that, like kind of empty uh, vessels that needed to be filled in. And then uh, we, we realized that's not the case. And luckily so. So there is so much more that um, that can happen. And uh, life is so much richer because of this active part in learning. Um so and then uh, yeah artificial intelligence can maybe come in a few years copying this mechanism but it seems that this active approach to life is a creative as well like yeah. it's a very unique um element that um comes from the human um it seems difficult to like we can copy it mm -hmm. but we cannot really create it maybe i don't know <laughs> Yeah. Time <laughs> um, so <clears throat> related to this is the fact that many pe people are afraid that um, AI might take over and turn against humanity and kind of um, we see a big um, threat there. And I think, yeah, there are probably some uh, intellectuals that like to ride this kind of sensationalism and uh, and uh, yeah, predict doom scenarios. What do you make of that? Like, what do you think? Is is there a risk? Yeah, again, it's a really huge question. And and you're completely right. I think one has to look at the motives of some of the people expressing these concerns. Some of them have very altruistic motives, but others, you know, some of the big companies in this space, there's obviously an advantage to them in a um, increasing the, or, or sort of amplifying what their tools can do. Um, and their sort of potential power, but also there's potentially advantage for them in regulation of sort of smaller companies that might want to come into this space and use these tools for, for new things. So we do have to be concerned a little bit or think a little bit about the, the sort of motivations. But on the other hand, I think there are definitely ways in which some of these AI tools could be used for, for negative outcomes. And whether that's the AI itself kind of causing problems or whether it's, you know, bad actors using it to spread misinformation or to um, for, for terrorist attacks on you know informational digital infrastructure, or whether it's um, you know skimming people's credit card details and identity fraud. You know, there's lots of ways in which it can be used by people who um, either by states or by individual people to create harms. So I definitely think we do need to come together as a community to think about you know what how do we regulate that when we come to you know infants and, and young children how do we 
think about their early environment and how do we make sure that these algorithms that try to suck your attention in on YouTube and you know all of the different apps that kids can play, how do we make sure that that's not taking their attention away from what we want them to learn about from these really rich social interactions? So I think we really need both regulation, but also just a sort of broader conversation to think mm -hmm. about what, where we want to go with this. Yeah, so maybe as parents, we, we can take um, the message that it's something that we need to learn about, something that we need to study in a way, that we need to, um, it, it's not enough to be afraid and shut it off because it's, mm. that's where our society is going now and uh, there is a lot of potential in there, okay. for both for good and also for harm. And so it's probably our responsibility to Mm, be willing to learn a little bit about it and try and of course when we do new things we might also get some things wrong but then it's better to try out and do our best rather than kind of freeze and and just be scared of it completely and then we can help our children navigate it because they're all going to encounter this you know brave new world and then unless we can as parents help them navigate through that they, they're going to really struggle yeah and our generation is quite um Particularly in this sense, because um, when it comes to AI and generally the digital world, it's a little bit as if we kind of really send them, our teenagers, we just send them in a kind of a black hole that we know very little about. I'm generalizing. Of course, it's not. I'm, I'm kind of generalizing uh, maybe our generation and the new one. Um, but there is a risk there that we know very little about about what our little ones are actually experiencing. And it's probably yeah. our responsibility to actually not just sit comfortably and see what happens, but accompany them. They still need our, our support or help our regulation in order to yeah. use those things for good. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, just uh, looking for my other questions. <laughs> um, so if AI is a tool for us to use, what are the benefits that you think it could um, um, bring to, to children, to parents, and in general to society? Yeah, so I think, I think there's definitely great potential too. So I think, you know, this potential for individualization is a real strength potentially of AI, whereby it can learn about your individual preferences and patterns and habits. And of course, we know that's how it gets used a lot on our phones to target advertising or to sell us things. But we can equally try and use that for, for good. So I myself I love online chess. And um, when you're doing online chess, the algorithm will find you a, a, a person to play with is about your level. And that's really good for learning because we can get into this, what we call a zone for proximal development, where you know, you're playing someone who's just a little bit better than you, sometimes a little bit worse than you. So it keeps you engaged because you're not always losing, but you're always sometimes playing someone who's going to be a little bit better so you can learn from them. So there's all sorts of things like that where, where AI can really help you know, individualize learning for different children, assist different children, and particularly neurodivergent children who might need really different things to what kind of the regular schooling service can provide. So I think we need to be thinking about those sorts of things. Yeah, because our human brain sometimes, um, it's difficult to take in and process all such different information, right? Like uh, this fact that we're all so different and that we, as parents, we know it very well. We really tend to look for the recipe that works with everyone. Yeah. And that's not what we get. And so if we can have some help in that respect, in kind of, perceiving acknowledging all this difference and then doing something with that it sounds uh, to me it sounds very attractive i have four kids and already those four people are too much for me to deal with <laughs> in terms of how different they are uh, so i'm very glad if if some ai can do their computations with it and uh, help out a little bit um no of course this is a big jump but um but i do think that um artificial intelligence is stronger than us in, in Treating data fast, and yeah. um, um, so why not use that that ability? Um, and then, just for the bigger picture, if you think about your studies and uh, and society, and what's your vision? Like how uh, you've been mentioning um, neurodivergent, uh, the neurodivergent population. How can AI, in particular, in your studies, act for the better in society? 
I, I re what I really hope is that, that we can use it, for example, for kids who struggle to communicate. So for kids who are nonverbal or who, do, who really struggle to communicate with the people around them as to what their needs are. There's lots of ways that people are developing to be able to either use brain activity to decode kind of what individual kids might want to say or what they're interested in. Obviously, we can use patterns of eye movements. And I really hope that, that we can use AI tools in that kind of space to really help us enable kids who are, who are struggling otherwise to tell us what they need to communicate that to us through the sort of medium of these algorithms that can kind of search around and, you know, identify what it is that actually they seem to be interested in. So I have hopes in that direction. And I think, again, these also educational tools whereby, um, you know, theoretically at least they can kind of give kids material to help them practice. So kids who again might be falling behind at school, the teacher doesn't have time to do a ton of individualized stuff with them. It may well be opportunities there for, you know, little math games and English games. And there are all sorts of things like that, you know, popping up. Um, but I think we do need to have this sort of broader understanding of where are the risks to that? You know, is, is there a risk that the algorithm tunes too much to you and actually then you never get this experience of failing? You know, how can we make sure that, um, you know, we don't want that to replace the human teacher ever, right? Because they're going to be really critical still for, for so many other reasons. So, you know, how do we find that balance where we can use these tools for good, but make sure that they're not kind of creating these harms that we're not aware of? Yeah, on no, a kind of... Yeah, on a bigger level, we, we know that teachers do complain a lot about the complexity and the workload that they've got. And so if they do need support and if this could come in, in this form, that, that sounds um, promising. And But yeah, as you were saying, um, there is something something intrinsically human that will never be replaced. And uh, um, But if we can get support, that's wonderful. Exactly. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. lovely. So on this, thank you so much, um, Professor Emily Jones, for being here with us today, talking about artificial intelligence in spite of the w uh, heat wave in London. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> so thank you so much and hoping to see you soon again here on Baby Brings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Bye. Bye.